I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, gun violence, gun control, and the business behind them both. We all know how bad it's got, and particularly in the United States, in part because there's serious money behind it. We look at the business of buying and selling and how cash enters and influences the political stream. Also this week, first the fall, now the rise again of Taiwan. For a decade it struggled to compete with China, but now thanks to a little innovation, there's a change in the air. And why a Swiss watchmaker thinks it's worth sinking more than $100 million into Equestrian. Hello everyone, this week we are looking at what happens when guns, politics, lobbyists and money all collide. Just from those four elements, you see very quickly what a dangerous mix that could be. But we really want to focus on the money side of things. Why buying a gun, particularly in the United States, is so easy, and how what you could call gun money re-enters the system and becomes part of the American political process. Of course, we're talking more about guns and gun violence these days because of what happened at Sandy Hook Elementary School in uh, Connecticut last year. Not that we haven't seen plenty of mass shootings in the United States before, but there was just something particularly galling, something particularly horrifying about the killing of 20 young children and six of their teachers. Certainly it's prompted more action from American politicians, but the battle remains the same, trying to find a balance between reducing the number of guns and also upholding the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution, which, quote, protects the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Just before we get started this week, have a quick listen to some of the major players to get an idea of the arguments and the obstacles. Here are the president, the gun lobbyist, and the gun victim. Uh, the only way that we're going to be able to do everything that needs to be done uh, is with the cooperation of Congress. And that means passing uh, serious laws that uh, restrict the access and availability of uh, assault weapons and magazine clips that aren't necessary. Uh, for uh, hunters and sportsmen and uh, those who, responsible gun owners uh, who are out there. I call on Congress today to act immediately to appropriate whatever is necessary to put armed police officers in every single school in this nation and to do it now. Speaking is difficult, but I need to say something important. Violence is a big problem. Too many children are dying. Too many children. We must do something. Yeah, she was incredibly brave giving that address. Gabrielle Giffords, a US politician who herself is a victim of gun crime. You could hear the gravity in what she said, but the problem is she and everyone else trying to fix gun crime in the US have a big uphill battle against them. Consider some of these numbers and you'll see what we're talking about. We have, give or take, 650 million guns owned by civilians around the world. Of those, 270 million are in the United States alone. That gives us the slightly scary ratio you see here of 90 guns per 100 people. Second on the list, it's Yemen, but still nowhere near the US. There we're looking at 55 firearms per 100 people. Uh, after that, it's Switzerland. Uh, an interesting case because uh, almost every adult male is legally required to have a gun. That puts 46 firearms uh, in the hands of every 100 people there. That's Switzerland. Moving on, we've got Finland with 45 to 100. Uh, next, down to Serbia, 37 to 100. And then after that, it's Iraq, which probably wouldn't surprise you too much. High rates there of 34 firearms per 100 people. But then you also get places like this, North Korea, Japan, where it's pretty much at zero, no guns to that particular ratio. Well, what is going on in the United States then? Why are there many more guns and why can't the sales of them be controlled? Hubert Williams is with us now from Washington, D.C. to discuss that. He's the former president of the Police Foundation, also chairman of the National Law Enforcement Partnership to Prevent Gun Violence. And we thank you for your time, Mr. Williams. What is going on with those numbers there? It just doesn't sound right when you have that many guns in the hands of, of that many people. Surely that's the crux of the issue. The law of averages says if there are that many guns out there, you're going to have problems at some stage. Clearly, that is a huge problem. 
Um, we're faced in this country with the constitutional issue, uh, the scope and extent of the Second Amendment with respect to guns. There are some advocates of gun rights that believe that there can be no restrictions uh, on the type of guns that people have or the number of guns that uh, people have. I was a leader in the fight uh, to get the uh, gun measures passed in 1994. We got a ban on assault weapons. We got the Brady Bill, which enabled the police to do a background check on anybody purchasing a weapon. Uh, we got a ban on machine guns. We got a ban on assault rifles. Now, the gun manufacturers uh, and the NRA uh, have powerful influence. Mm. So there are lots of problems here. But what about the business of guns, you know, the retail side of things? I've got the numbers here which say there are 130,000 licensed firearms dealers in the United States. I mean, the short story is it seems too easy here. You know, I wonder if there needs to be on top of regulation a sort of, you know, retail responsibility, a retailer who's willing to go over and above the regulations and try to be, you know, if there is such a thing in this situation, a responsible firearms dealer. Well, you got to remember one thing that, uh, and you said it right from the outset, a business. These people are in the business to make money. Now, I don't think that they would uh, sell the guns to a, a known terrorist or anything like that. But if they have to bend, they're going to bend on the side of a profit margin, just like every other business does. You can't really control it uh, from the retail level. You got to control it from the law that limits and establishes what retailers are allowed to do. Do those retailers put pressure? Do you think, you know, we always talk about the NRA as being the, the ones who put the pressure and have the, the influence, I think was the word you used, you know. Uh, but as we said, it's a business. Businesses have influence anywhere in society. Are they the ones putting pressure as well in this situation? Uh, clearly, they, 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 they are part of the problem because if you are putting regulations into place that's going to inhibit their ability to promote their business, then they're going to have a problem with that. If you're putting regulations in place that's going to reduce the potential profit margin that they're able to make, then they're going to have a problem with that. Um, you know, some people in this country uh, would not be satisfied unless guns are as open and available to the American people as candy and popcorn is in a corner store. Um, you can regulate motor vehicles. Everyone is required to get a license. Everyone that gets a driver's license is required to get a t pass a test before they do that. But these guns, there's no restrictions, no requirements whatsoever. Mm -hmm. If you're going to purchase a weapon from a licensed federal dealer, then you must have a uh, background check before you can purchase that weapon. But what they've done is they have uh, other ways to get those weapons. They don't have to go through licensed federal dealers. They can get those weapons at gun shows. So we have, in the law enforcement community, uh, looked at the uh, percentage of weapons that are being purchased outside of uh, the licensed federal dealers, and it looks like it's about 40%. We simply got to try and prevent an enormous catastrophe, more uh, deadly than the ones we've had in the past, from occurring. That means we've got to begin to structure laws that's going to ensure that the guns that are sold do not get into the wrong hands. Just a final thought from you, Mr. Williams, because you know everything you've said has made perfect sense. It, it sounds like it makes perfect sense, but it all has to be reconciled with the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, and, and that is, you know, if I can be so blunt about the U.S. Constitution, it's a stumbling block when we're talking about controlling guns. In an ideal world, how would you reconcile those two things? Well, number one, the, the most recent Supreme Court decision does indicate that um, the Second Amendment. Uh, is not unlimited. There are limits to all of these amendments in the Constitution of the United States. For example, uh, the First Amendment allows you the right to freedom of speech, but you don't have a right to yell fire in a crowded theater if there's no fire, because you put at jeopardy and at risk the lives of too many innocent people. Therefore, um, 
The Second Amendment is no real bar, in my view, to establishing good gun measures that will limit the potential for violence and innocent people getting killed. The problem goes with the politics in America and the power of the gun lobby uh, in this country. Even the NRA, irrespective of what the leadership is saying now, when you poll the membership, they believe in some regulations, clearly background checks, they believe in this. They believe it'll be fine to have background checks to keep the guns out of the hands of the wrong people. Uh, so our problem is more political than it is Constitution. The Constitution does constitute an issue, but it's not an overwhelming, overarching issue that would prevent us from getting sensible gun control measures established in this country. Hubert Williams, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, you're welcome. Now, a lot of what we discussed there with Mr. Williams was about the flow of money into the industry. It does head out as well, though, perhaps not in such great volumes, but it's incredibly influential money going to some pretty influential places. Here are the stats for the NRA, the National Rifle Association, which is one of America's biggest lobby groups. It's got four million members who in 2010 contributed $100 million towards the organization. That was out of a total NRA income of $228 million. Some of that in turn heads out again in the form of lobbying. Now, during the 2012 election campaign, the NRA is said to have helped fund 247 members of Congress as well as 42 members of the Senate. In money, that was $18.6 million. Interestingly, though, it seems it wasn't really the best placed money. For example, Ohio Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown was a 2012 winner, even though $900,000 was spent to unseat him. Same story with Senator Bill Nelson in Florida, 630000 unsuccessfully spent against him and $612,000 spent and effectively wasted trying to defeat the Virginia Senator Tim Kaine. Whether it was successful or not, the issue here though is that gun money is becoming political money and so the act of trying to bring about change in the law is directly competing with political funding. Let's go back to Washington DC. Vivica Novak's in the seat now. She's the Editorial and Communications Director at the Center for Responsive Politics known as OpenSecrets.org on the internet. And Vivica, I have to say that you know these numbers that we look at in the grand scheme of things perhaps it's not huge amounts of money, but as I've said before, it is the, the influence. And I think, you know, an international audience watching this might be looking at it and going, wow, a, a gun lobby gives so much money into the political system. Well, they do give a substantial amount of money. It pales in comparison to something like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's giving, but it is still substantial. And the thing is that up until recently, there's really been very little spending on the other side of the issue. Uh, those groups really don't have very much money to give to politicians or, or spend on lobbying. And uh, that may change now with Mayor Bloomberg and others uh, starting up groups to oppose the gun lobby. But so far, they've kind of been out there alone with this issue. I don't know if I can be as black and white about an issue like this as I'm going to be in this question, but I'm still going to try. Is it wrong? Is it out and out wrong for a gun lobby to be giving money to politicians? I think that's a moral argument that I wouldn't opine on, but certainly, you know, the First Amendment says everyone has the right to petition their government. And uh, so if you're, if you're lobbying, if you're giving money to politicians, certainly it's legal, whether it's morally wrong, I guess, is for others to decide. <laughs> Very nicely answered as well. You know, did it surprise you, though, the more research you did, Vivica, to see how deep it went, you know, not just the amounts of money, but where it was going here, the number of politicians, 84% of Republicans, 8% uh, of Democrats, these are the numbers you've got of people who have uh, received NRA money. Very, very partisan. Uh, uh, there are very few Democrats that the NRA supports. Uh, there are some important ones, but still very few of them. Um, and I think what's powerful about the NRA goes beyond the numbers that you see in their campaign finance reports or the lobbying reports. Uh, the NRA has, they say, more than four million members scattered all over the country. And these are people who believe that it is their constitutional right to own firearms, and they don't want that interfered with in any way. They're very passionate about it. And the NRA is very good at mobilizing those people to be in touch with their members of Congress. You know, given the amount of negative press there is now about guns in general, obviously it's, you know, it's happened more since, since an incident like Sandy Hook 
but the debate has of course always been there. You know, do you think politicians have to start to worry about their image, the fact that yes, they are getting gun money to, to fund their political ambitions, or is that again, as we've discussed, just part of the political process now, just the way it works? I don't know if they're starting to worry about uh, receiving money from the NRA. I do think that you're seeing a little bit more movement on Capitol Hill uh, in the sense of there might be some action uh, taken, some very limited action, but some action nevertheless. I certainly wouldn't um, bet on it, but it, it may happen. That may be uh, mobilized far more by Democrats who aren't getting NRA money, uh, but you may see some Republicans start to come along as well. Tell me more, Vivica, about you know the other side of the coin. You mentioned it in your first answer, the fact that there is not a lot of money coming from the other side of the argument, if you like. Just explain for us, tell us you know, what is the other side of, of the argument and, and, and you know, who are these groups who want to give more money perhaps to get perhaps more influence? There are several groups out there that are um, opposing uh, the NRA in terms of, uh, you know, they want more restrictions on guns, uh, tougher background checks and uh, bans on assault weapons, that kind of thing. Um, but these groups, they've been out there for years and years and they simply don't have very much money. They, ironically, they have even less money when a Democrat is in the White House because people uh, don't perceive that the president is going to take action um, that would help the NRA, so they don't see any reason to help the anti-gun lobby. Um, but, you know, as I said, these groups have very little money for either lobbying or campaign contributions. Um, they try to take the moral high road and show some statistics, but it's not as powerful an argument, uh, made not as passionately, I think. How much do you think does this now form part of the actual debate on gun control? You know, we saw the, the Senate hearing. I know they're not going to discuss things like cash flow in a, in a, in a place like that, but you know, does it become part of the argument? Or again, is it just, as we've already pointed out, it's, it's basically endemic, you know, and it is a right to lobby the government as you see fit, as you've pointed out. I haven't seen the money that the NRA gives or spends uh, become too much of a part of the argument yet. Uh, the whole conversation may change. Certainly uh, Sandy Hook has changed the conversation a bit. So we will see if it, if it does become part of the argument. The NRA's spending in the last election, uh, they did uh, a lot of independent spending on their own in addition to giving to candidates, but they spent about $18 million uh, running ads themselves for or against candidates. They spent it fairly poorly, as it turns out. They had a very low success rate with that independent spending. Um, that may wash back on, on the group as well, but it's unclear right now. Vivica Novak from OpenSecrets.org. Thank you so much for your time today. Good talking with you. And still ahead this week on Counting the Cost, horses, watches and $130 million. How does all that add up? We'll tell you a little later when we look at sports' latest big money deal. We brought you some really interesting stuff from our correspondent Steve Chow last week who was in Macau. Uh, this week he is in Taiwan looking at a manufacturing industry which has really been through its ups and downs. When you consider that, and this is according to Yale University, the US lost more than three and a half million manufacturing jobs to China between 2000 and 2007. Well you can only imagine the hit that little Taiwan took. How to combat it? Well as Steve found out, you get creative. You could say it was a gamble that made Hyperbola Textiles what it is today. Headquartered in one of the trendiest areas of Taipei, the company's selection of high-performance fabrics are now in demand from the world's leading outdoor clothing brands. Ten years ago, Tina Wong, the company's founder, was doing marketing for Taiwan's failing textile industry. Seeing a bleak future, she risked millions to set up a new venture, designing fabrics of the future. Ten-something years ago, Taiwan didn't have quality textile brands. Most companies just supplied cheap fabric, which China had in abundance. So we changed that by spending on R&D. Another recent innovation among Taiwanese fabric makers involves taking recycled coffee grounds and the fiber that comes from old water bottles to form a unique thread. Dry fast. 
It's not only quick to dry and odor absorbing, but it can also be spun into waterproof clothing. That's far more breathable than conventional materials. The fish is happy, 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 happy. Its inventor, happy, Jason Chen of happy. Syntex, has received orders from athletic giants like Nike. Not bad considering just a few years ago his factories, which spun conventional cotton materials, faced bankruptcy. If you find easy things, don't touch it, okay? Find the things more difficult, more challenging yourself, then you can win. Otherwise, you cannot survive. Taiwan's textile industry was once the pillar of the island's economy and hummed along providing much of the world with its fabric. Then, Made in China became a household name. Overseas customers stopped ordering, thousands of factories closed. The companies that did survive got on by mostly selling to Taiwan's home market. Up until now, tariffs imposed on Chinese-made products have been a lifeline in keeping more traditional factories like this one running. But a free trade deal signed with China three years ago means that those tariffs, that protection, will soon be lifted. That's given fabric businesses a push, but innovation costs. Year in, year out, we are always trying new things, but it's expensive to do so. We are not like the big giants, we're just a small company, and not everything works. Syntex's retooled factories prove it is possible. Orders for their coffee-infused fabric line have poured in, leading to record profits, reshaping the landscape of Taiwan's textile industry. For Counting the Cost, I'm Steve Chow in Taipei, Taiwan. And finally this week, something a bit sporty, but also an illustration of just how much value some companies place on sports sponsorship. Equestrian, it's not exactly a mainstream popular sport, but it has specialist requirements, you know, things like timing. And so enter watchmaker Longines with a nine-figure sponsorship deal, and suddenly you've got exposure and a very happy governing body. This report now from Matt Rumsey in Switzerland. They're going to need more face paint and camels here soon. This World Cup jumping event in Zurich is just one of over 3,000 competitions organized annually by the FEI, the governing body of equestrian sport. Despite the global financial slowdown, the sport is booming and about to receive an unprecedented investment. Over $130 million from new sponsor Swiss watchmaker Longines. Her Royal Highness Princess Haya of Jordan, the President of the Federation, has already signed the papers. It's wonderful to know um, that the FEI has this kind of a partnership um, you know, on, on board now and that hopefully we can look forward to more of those in the future because that stability for, for, for the FEI is, is, is really crucial. And, um, it's, yeah, for me, it's like seeing, see, seeing your child go to school and knowing they'll be okay. The 10-year agreement that sees Rolex replaced by Longines is expected to transform the sport, and the deal is not just for cash. The state-of-the-art technology involved in making Swiss watches will be integrated into equestrian sport. Giant screens, state-of-the-art scoreboards, and real-time competition updates across a host of media platforms. Luciana Diniz competed for Portugal at the London Olympics. She says it's the right time. We cannot keep all the time the same, otherwise we don't grow. So we have to find a way now to bring something new in our sport. And with the money, with the sponsors, I do believe we have a great opportunity to make that happen. The multi-million dollar deal is the biggest ever brokered by the Equestrian Federation. It alone guarantees a new era of professionalism for the sport. If there is a global financial crisis, Swiss watchmakers appear to be immune. There's only one thing more remarkable than the nine-digit figure they've agreed to invest, and that's the timing. Yeah! Matt Rumsey, counting the cost, Zurich, Switzerland. And that's our lot for this week. Plenty more online, though, at aljazeera.com slash business. You'll find the latest business headlines there and a link to the Counting the Cost page. You can watch this or any of our previous episodes again there. Then when you want to get in touch, you can hop on Twitter. Uh, I'm there at Kamal AJE, also our business editor at Arvid Oliver Ali, or you can drop us an email, countingthecost at aljazeera.net. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Yeah.